This is the uh, Salitre Hospital. We're about four hours by foot from San Salvador right now. When the offensive starts, this will be the closest hospital, and I'm the only physician in this hospital. We I remember looking at, at areas of Laos uh, and areas of Vietnam, but I recall more vividly Laos flying over the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail that looked like the moon. I mean, just, mm. just acres of pockmarked fields that were without vegetation. And uh, there was much of the countryside that was just completely destroyed by the, the bombing and the defoliant war. You could, you could smell the moldiness of this, of this medicine that we're trying to air out. This is a, a precious supply that uh, these people had to bury when they left uh, Las Cabanas in uh, November as a result of a, of a government offensive. They just had to quickly bury it. And yesterday they sent a commando team back to, to dig it up. They were able to recover the medicine, but as you can see, it's most of the packages are moldy, and a lot of the medicine was uh, was destroyed. So I said I would like a change of of duty not related to Southeast Asia, and explained that I was becoming more and more angry about everything I saw there, and uh, felt that uh, it would be better if I had a change of assignment. When I started talking about a secret bombing war, a secret invasion, uh, a Phoenix program in which thousands of suspected uh, uh, peasant sympathizers were being assassinated, I think he thought I was crazier than a loot, and he <laughs> committed me to a psychiatric ward. She uh, received this wound when she was nine months pregnant. She walked three days, and then she delivered her baby after that, and uh, didn't have any treatment until that, until that fourth day. So this is the, the types of problems we're seeing here. And most of the patients I'm seeing are civilians who weren't combatants and uh, were just innocent victims. People I was seeing weren't communists, weren't terrorists, weren't subversives. They were people who were trying to change their lives. I Charlie Clemens was a pilot in Vietnam. He is now a medical doctor with the rebels in El Salvador. We'll hear his story tonight on Alternative Views. It seems that so frequently on alternative views, we are so fortunate in having people present to you information that they have experienced at the spot of contention, so to speak. We've had people come to us who have lived in Central America or in, taken trips to Cuba or to various places in Africa or people from Russia, etc. Well, tonight we are very fortunate to have Charlie Clements with us. Charlie is a person, an Austinite who started out as a, an Air Force officer flying missions in Vietnam. Now he's coming to us as a doctor who has been functioning in the rebel-held areas of El Salvador. Now that's quite a change, quite a gap from Vietnam to El Salvador in those capacities. But we're going to find out what's happening down there, and we're going to find out the Charlie Clements story tonight. He has testified before Congress on a couple of occasions. He's, he's made presentations at universities around the country, and has also been on many of the national media TV shows, etc. So we have an awful lot in store for you tonight. Charlie, can you start off by telling us, giving us your background. How was it you left Austin and went to the Air Force Academy and wound up in Vietnam? Well, I grew up in Austin and <clears throat> my father was in the Air Force. Uh, my older brother went to the Air Force Academy and as I look back on it, I was I think, raised from the time I was this high to, to be a, an Air Force officer. It was certainly a voluntary decision and a, a very honorable thing to do in, in that time. I remember at St. Edward's when it was announced that I had won the appointment that not only was I very, very happy, but uh, most of my classmates in the school were happy for me as well. 
could you tell us a bit about your experiences in Vietnam? What did you actually do in your military experience, and what disillusioned you with American foreign policy, the American military, and led you to embark on your new life? Well, I was fortunate enough to have gone to UCLA to graduate school for a few months after the academy, and I think in some ways there were some seeds planted there. And what year was this? That was 1967 67. Uh, and, and a little bit of 68. Mm -hmm. And I recall vividly passing by those long lines of people in silent vigils thinking that uh, they're a little bit confused. I'm going to Vietnam soon to defend their right to protest, but that's what America's all about. And I never really had any dialogue with people there. But when I got to Vietnam, I slowly began to see things that bothered me. Now, this was at a time before Watergate. So for me uh, to come to, to terms with the fact that the president was knowingly lying to the American public was very difficult. And I remember one time Nixon coming on TV and telling the American public there were no troops in Laos, nor did he intend to commit any. I knew that day that my classmates were flying out of unmarked airplanes and secret air bases resupplied by Air America C-130s. So I began to, to come to grips with those contradictions. I looked around me one time, and uh, my job was flying personnel around on cargo or medical evacuation. I was a C-130 pilot. And I found in the back of the aircraft that a majority of the people were black Chicano or, or poor whites. That that the kinds of people that had been around me at UCLA, for instance, weren't there. And I recalled how everyone was, was busily trying to get a deferment, was trying to get into graduate school or to get married or have a child or whatever it took. There was this whole series of things that had been very foreign to me. And I saw the effect of that because the kids I was, I was taking out to those fire bases were, were for the most part, uh, there because they had no alternatives. They had no choices that other people had. So what were, the, what were like their that. attitudes? Were they looking forward to it? Did they want to go kill them some gooks, or were they resentful? Or were they, did they have any awareness of what the situation They were scared. Mm -hmm. They were scared to talk to me because I was an officer. Mm -hmm. And even engaging them in conversation was difficult. And it was obvious to me that these were people who, who wouldn't challenge authority. It's very easy for white middle class people to challenge authority when, when their fathers maybe hired a lawyer for them or tried to get them a psychiatrist to help them get out of things. But these were kids from from rural Kansas, for instance, who, who never would have challenged the authority of a, of a draft board. And what were your actual activities yourself in Vietnam? Were you doing on flying missions? Were you in combat? I was flying uh, what are termed combat missions, but that means just flying in any area that was contested. At some point, I had decided I didn't want to kill anybody, so I was a non-combatant. Mm -hmm. I flew a C-130. My missions really covered most of the theater. I flew into Cambodia. I flew into Thailand, into Vietnam, and, and many other parts of Southeast Asia. And it afforded me much more than the bird's eye view of the war that most soldiers had who were just trying to preserve their physical integrity. I didn't have a very dangerous job in, in the sense that others did. Did you see a lot of ecological damage and a lot of defoliation and destruction of the environment from the bombing? Oh, absolutely. I remember looking at at areas of Laos uh, and areas of Vietnam, but I recall more vividly Laos flying over the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail that looked like the moon. I mean, just, mm. just acres of pockmarked fields that were without vegetation. And uh, there was much of the countryside that was just completely destroyed by the, the bombing and the defoliant war. You mentioned uh, Cambodia. That was supposed to be a neutral country, was it not? That wasn't even supposed to be involved, and yet America was flying secret missions in there. That was one of the things that would lead to my decision to, mm. to not continue flying anymore. I flew the State Department in there on secret missions and during that time I found out about the secret bombing war which had been going on for more than a year. I was led to believe by intelligence operatives who were friends in, in Saigon that after the government of Sihanouk fell that we had in fact engineered the coup that led to Law Nol coming to power because mm. we wanted to bomb and invade the sanctuary, and Sihanouk had said, no, that's going to engulf us in this war. And uh, I found myself flying troops to the border, that is the Cambodian-Vietnamese border, in late April of 1970, preparing for an invasion of Cambodia, and that was the time that I decided I didn't want to have anything more to do with it. And what did the, how did the Air Force react to this? Well, they didn't know quite how to react because I had no contact with the anti-war movement. It wasn't a political statement. It was a statement of, 
what I perceived as right and wrong, and I even still felt obliged to stay in the Air Force. So I said I would like a change of, of duty not related to Southeast Asia and explained that I was becoming more and more angry about everything I saw there and uh, felt that uh, it would be better if I had a change of assignment. So I was sent, as any pilot was who, who had any problems, was sent to a psychiatrist. And that psychiatrist <laughs> said he had to send me back to the United States where someone could evaluate me. When I started talking about a secret bombing war, a secret invasion, uh, a Phoenix program in which thousands of suspected uh, uh, peasant sympathizers were being assassinated, I think he thought I was crazier than a loot. <laughs> and he committed me to a psychiatric ward. There in the ward, I went through a lot of confusion. I went through some depression, some anger. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what I was doing there. And eventually got a good lawyer who helped me to, to kind of make some decisions. And that was that I could have fought this uh, in the courts. And he basically said I had no chance at all that they mm -hmm. would throw the book at me. I wasn't a conscientious objector. Mm -hmm. I refused to say, in fact, that I wouldn't have fought in a non-combatant capacity in World War II. Right. So the choice was to accept a psychiatric discharge, which I, which I did. And what year was this? That was in 1971 when I was finally discharged. Isn't that ironic? That sounds so much like what happens in the Soviet Union. They find people whom they don't like or people who dissent. They say you're crazy and they send you to a psychiatric hospital, which is the same as jail. Well, <laughs> to some extent, I don't feel it as an abuse of psychiatry like the Soviet Union, but I was an officer. Had I been an enlisted man, I probably would have been in jail mm, instead of in a, in a psychiatric ward. And I was on a national radio program the other day, and someone called up from Accuracy Media and said, now we want those listeners to know that this man is crazy, that he has a psychiatric <laughs> discharge. And a psychiatrist then called up and said, I discharged lots of pilots, because any of them that, that protested oh. what was going on uh, met with a similar kind of disposition. So and there were a lot uh, of them? So I suppose you? there were others. I didn't meet but a few, but... Uh, mm. To me, it seems like a criterion of rationality to get out of the war because what they're doing there is wrong, because they're killing, because there's all these problems with the whole Vietnam foreign policy <clears throat> that it seems to me a rational person would see into. Well, it was a catch-22, uh, catch of course, yeah. uh, <laughs> because what they said to me was that I had to be willing to fly any place in the world at any time for the Air Force if I was to be fit to fly. I said I would fly any place in the world for the Air Force any time except in Vietnam. So that made me not fit to fly by their criteria. And mm. so there was kind of a catch-22 involved in the, in the whole thing. So when you got discharged, what happened then? Well, I found myself at age 25 without having any idea of what I wanted in life. I had always done what was expected and what was right. I had been the good high school a student, I had been the good cadet, I was an outstanding graduate, I had been the good graduate student, the good pilot, the good officer, and now what was I to be the good? Mm. Uh, and it forced me to reevaluate my whole value system. Uh, I would travel in the third world a lot and, and work in the third world and come to understand politically what was happening in Southeast Asia and also what uh, our role in the world was uh, to a greater extent and would uh, come to accept us to some extent uh, the fact that my psychiatric discharge wasn't going to affect me in, in the least in, in doing what I wanted to do. What were the third world countries you were in and what experience led to these insights? Well, I worked in, uh, as an ordinary seaman on some uh, banana boats, I guess you might, you might call them, and so I visited Central America, and that was the first time I came in I contact see. with some of the conditions there. Uh, I would drive a tractor and work as a, as a uh, field hand in uh, uh, some islands in the Pacific. I would work as a health worker in, uh, in India. And uh, living close to people in the third world, I came to understand a little bit more how they perceive the United States, but also how our policies affected their lives to some extent. When, particularly when you were in Central America, did you see the indigenous poverty or suffering or oppression that the people were experiencing that would lead them to seek revolutionary change? Did you have some experiences of that order or did that come later? I saw that, but uh, the close understanding of that that would lead to, 
to revolution came came later because mm -hmm. certainly the the suffering there was not much different than the suffering in India, mm -hmm. and yet in India it has in fact it's probably worse there. It hasn't yet led to the kind of change that we're seeing in Latin America. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you went to medical school and became a public health. Uh, oh, got a master's degree in public health as well. Is that correct? That's correct. And then after graduating, where did you hang your shingle? Well, I went to Salinas, California, where I began working with uh, a large indigenous population of farm workers. And uh, it was there I first began to see refugees from El Salvador. And what year was this? That was in 1980 and 1981. And what then led you to actually go down and practice medicine in El Salvador? I began hearing uh, echoes of what I had heard 20 years before as a young man. Uh, there were calls for more helicopters, calls for more advisors. There were cries, if we don't stop them in El Salvador, we'll have to stop them as they come across the Rio Grande. I had heard that before, only it had been, <laughs> if we don't stop them in Vietnam, we'll have to stop them at the Golden Gate Bridge. And the people I saw still bore physical and psychological marks of torture. Mm -hmm. I think that, that we all live in a lot of abstractions in this country, and seeing these people transform, for me, some of those abstractions about repression yeah. into a very human tragedy. Now, I had been speaking about El Salvador for some time, mm -hmm. probably almost a year by that time. Uh, a delegation of American physicians had gone there and documented a campaign of terror against the health sector. They had written a brochure called Abuses of Medical Neutrality. Mm in which they outlined and documented physicians being shot in the operating room, nurses killed in clinics, patients dragged from their hospital beds and shot, the closure of the only medical school, much of the faculty that wasn't arrested were, were driven into exile. And I was speaking to medical colleagues here about what was happening in the health sector in El Salvador. Becoming more frustrated at people's inability to grasp the seriousness of what was happening and also Fearing another Vietnam, I began to look at a way that I might uh, make a larger contribution than I was making just speaking about it. And in the years intervening between Vietnam, I had made a personal commitment to nonviolence. So I began examining what role I might play in this process to prevent a Vietnam, but also to perhaps be a witness to what was going on because there was so much distortion. The people I was seeing weren't communists, weren't terrorists, weren't subversives. They were people who were trying to change their lives. I, I remember very vividly meeting a 54-year-old school teacher who had organized her 12-teacher elementary school, had received a death threat, been beaten, and fled the country the next day, knowing they meant business because they had killed her brother, a principal of a high school, just the week before. And that was the kind of patient that I was meeting that was fleeing from the repression in El Salvador, fleeing the government, not uh, the Revolutionary Democratic Front. And how extensive is the repression in El Salvador? Well, what are some more examples of the sort of thing that the people were suffering that led you to actively intervene? The Revolutionary Democratic Front was made up of just about uh, every sector of society there. It included the Federation of Christian Campesinos, which had come under severe attack. It included ANJAS, the National Association of Teachers, which came under severe attack. It included MIPTUS, the inter independent movement of professionals and technicians that had come under attack as, as engineers, lawyers, and physicians. It included the social and Christian Democrats who had tried to bring about reforms in the first junta and had to drop out because they couldn't control the violence. So it touched virtually every sector of the society. Labor organizations, oh, too. Oh, Finestras, the umbrella organization of, of, of unions, was was viciously attacked as well. Basically, anyone who was trying to bring about change was labeled a communist. And we, I think we know well the stories of the religious workers. Uh, first, a number of priests, uh, then nuns, and Archbishop Romero, of course, mm -hmm. who were also labeled communist or subversive because they were trying to adjust issues of social uh, change. So it was a reign of terror that has been going on in El Salvador. Anyone who opposes the government is immediately labeled a communist or a subversive and is subject to severe attack, repression, torture, and murder even. Oh, absolutely. And it can continue partially because no one is ever brought to trial for that. So uh, we heard in the Los uh, Las Ojas 
massacre, which occurred in January of this year, there were 18 Indians working their land in eastern El Salvador. One of the large landowners wanted to bring a road through that land that was their cooperative, and they objected to that. He pointed out to the local uh, militias that these men were, in fact, subversives. So the soldiers came and massacred uh, about 18 of them. That was the first case that the new human rights organization of El Salvador has, has uh, investigated, and now the man who conducted the investigation fears for his life. The major who directed the soldiers in that massacre uh, received a promotion, and no one has been brought to trial for it. There have been 40,000 deaths uh, in the last 40 months, none of which have ever been brought to trial, regardless of whether it's the nuns. 40,000? 40, 40,000 in 40 months are what most of the estimates are. And yet there's been at least four different certifications by the Reagan administration that the human rights situation is improving in El Salvador. <laughs> there's not as much torture and murder, et cetera. What, what is your response when you see that? Are, are these people just uninformed? Are they cynical? The Congress or whoever that just rubber stamps or accepts? Well, these? they don't rubber stamp it. They have no actual say mm -hmm. in it. Uh, the president uh, certifies, and uh, the Congress doesn't approve or disapprove of that certification. I just participated in the post-certification hearings, mm -hmm. and many of the congresspersons are very, very skeptical and certainly point out that there appears to be no progress, that the military isn't controlled, that land reform isn't working, but that doesn't keep the president from certifying that. But I don't think that's an unusual circumstance. We heard that the president today at the American Bar Association meeting was telling people that he has a much better record in uh, women's issues and, and minority issues than the public would believe and that he's been misrepresented. And I think uh, if he says the emperor is naked, he expects people to believe it. <laughs> Charlie, you brought a documentary with us to look at. Uh, can you introduce it? Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Well, it was made soon after I had entered El Salvador, and uh, my participation in it was somewhat of an accident. There was an American film crew who would come there to film a little bit about what life was like in the control zones, that is, the areas that the opposition controls right. in El Salvador. They agreed to film this uh, to use for raising money for humanitarian aid. The film was not made without some cost. Two of the people were killed who were trying to carry some oh. of the film out of El Salvador. Oh. Uh, of course, the, the, the photographers risk their lives even making this film, but it gives you a little bit of the reality about uh, El Salvador. And I had just been there for a short time when it was made, but there's, there's nothing inaccurate about what I said at the time. I was still somewhat untested, but that would, that would change very, very quickly. I think I mentioned in the film that the hospital I was in was subject to being overrun and we kept it minimally equipped so we could put everything on our back and run. It was overrun and burned about two weeks later. Oh. And those are the kind of conditions that uh, we dealt with most of the year there. Let's take a look at it. This is an American doctor entering El Salvador to work in the areas controlled by the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front guerrillas. He is bringing with him 75 pounds of medicine and equipment for 10,000 people. That's the, the pulgas and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This uh, young woman is not untypical of what I've seen here. She has a, an abscess in her leg. The small entry you can see there is where a hand grenade fragment entered when she was about nine months pregnant. Uh, I've seen a lot of chronic uh, infections here and a lot of abscesses from people who receive small wounds but are unable to have them tended for some time after, after they receive them. She's yet to receive any antibiotics simply because there aren't any. We're trying to uh, open up the, the entry wound and drain it with hot compresses a few times a day and hopefully we'll have to uh, uh, go deeper to explore the abscess. She uh, received this wound when she was nine months pregnant. She walked three days and then she delivered her baby after that and uh, didn't have any treatment until that, until that fourth day. So this is the, the types of problems we're seeing here. And most of the patients I'm seeing are civilians who weren't combatants and uh, were just innocent victims. Well, as a, as a physician, I think that, that uh, what I can accomplish may be very little since 
the only medicine and the only equipment I may have is what I can carry on my back, but I think my presence here uh, is symbolic and is very important of the solidarity of many people in the United States that, that uh, are in sympathy with the struggle of the people here in El Salvador. I've been told again and again when I tell the people that I bring the solidarity of many people that they know that the people of the United States aren't their enemy, it's the government of the United States that's creating their problems here. I was working uh, in a county hospital in California doing some uh, solidarity work as well and uh, I was struck by the resonance that, uh, that I found between the struggle of the campesinos here and the farm workers in California and how well they understood the, the importance of solidarity. Yeah. Most of my solidarity work though was with uh, medical communities because those are the ones that, that I understand the best and one very important a report that I would talk about was the report of the Public Health Commission where some very distinguished American physicians came down to El Salvador and interviewed many people in the health sector from the Ministry of Health on down. What they found was quite shocking and they, they related and documented a number of physicians being shot in the operating room, patients being dragged from their beds and being shot, uh, patients and physicians being killed in clinics in front of other patients in, in a fairly brutal fashion which in general amounted to a, a system of terror to keep the medical profession here and the health profession in general from treating anyone that had any wounds. And as we know, about 90% of the casualties in this war are civilians. And uh, their plight began to worry me as I continued to give solidarity talks. When I left Vietnam, I had a firm commitment to nonviolence. And I think over the years, I've kind of considered myself a, a, a Quaker more than any, any other religion. So I had to examine very, very closely before I came down here the, the apparent conflict between nonviolence and what I was participating in as a revolutionary struggle. I think one has to consider, though, the, the, the violence that the government has done to people here through starvation and through unemployment and through years of, of oppression that hasn't allowed them to receive health care, education, or to organize in, in unions. I think that kind of violence is, is probably far worse than the kind of violence the people will have to resort to to attain social justice here. This is Comandante Ramon, a former medical student. He and the doctor are discussing the best way of dividing up the sparse amount of medicine available in this camp. I wish you had a uh, uh, sensor for smell in your cameras right now. You could you could smell the moldiness of this of this medicine that we're trying to air out. This is a, a precious supply that uh, these people had to bury when they left uh, Las Cabanas in uh, November as a result of a, of a government offensive. They just had to quickly bury it. And yesterday they sent a commando team back to, to dig it up. They were able to recover the medicine, but as you can see, it's most of the packages are moldy and a lot of the medicine was, uh, was destroyed. Uh, unfortunately, there's no antibiotics here. There is some uh, uh, gauze, there's uh, some lidocaine. Much of the aluminum caps were, were uh, eroded. There's some catheters and uh, some IV equipment, so it'll be certainly useful as they're expecting a, a government offensive any any day against this uh, this village itself. This is Dr. Hasmin. She's in charge of the clinics at the gorilla front of Wasapa. She's treating a man whose leg was fractured by shrapnel from a 250-pound bomb. Dr. Hasmin explains that the paramedics initially applied a bamboo splint to the man's broken leg. When he arrived at the clinic, a plaster cast was applied. <laughs> Like it's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. The doctor is supervising an inexperienced paramedic pulling an infected tooth. The tools being used are part of the medical equipment purchased by the doctor.
This is the uh, Salitre Hospital. We're about four hours by foot from San Salvador right now. When the offensive starts, this will be the closest hospital and the referral hospital to the central hospital, which uh, I was at before. I'm the only physician in this hospital. We have three experienced nurses and several unexperienced uh, paramedics here. As you can see, our equipment is fairly primitive. This is our entire stock of medicines here on, on my left. We received our first two patients this morning, a head wound and a through and through hand wound, which I think you've seen already. Naturally, we have to do things differently here than we would someplace else. If I was in the United States, we would have opened that hand and pinned it and repaired the tendon. As it was, that young man will probably not regain the use of his hand because we won't be able to do a tendon repair. Uh, and uh, we have no plaster for immobilization, so we'll have to splint his hand and uh, hope that he can get enough, uh, enough bone growth to, to uh, repair the, the fifth metacarpal. Conditions here are pretty rough. The table I'm sitting on is an old kitchen table. This will be our operating table. And uh, we're prepared to do abdominal or thoracic surgery if necessary. And since this is the closest hospital, I, I suspect that we'll have to do some. Um, we have some anesthesia here. We're hoping to get a lantern so we can have a little more light for operations. And uh, we're expecting a lot of action in the next in the next few days as the offensive picks up pace. Abra la boca, Salvador. Abra bien, bien la boca. Yeah. This is a Savidre. We're on the south side of the Rosapa volcano, and it's from here that uh, the offensive against San Salvador will start. We're about four hours by foot from San Salvador. This is the uh, frontline hospital, and we've had a week of feverish activity preparing, sterilizing bandages, training paramedics, and, and getting our surgical equipment ready. Uh, as you saw, we had a real sparse supply of medicines, and uh, as mean, the physician in charge of this whole sector has purposely kept this hospital minimally equipped because there's a chance that we'll get overrun. We have to be able to put everything on our backs and, and run if that's the case. The uh, commander of this column asked me to examine his troops to uh, basically do a screen check uh, for combat. And uh, most of the most of the young men, of course, certainly physical fitter, they wouldn't they wouldn't be here. And uh, I'm basically checking uh, for a database as well, so we can know if they've had a anti tetanus vaccination to see if they know their blood type. Check past wounds that they might have gotten and uh, any any kind of minimal data that might be helpful to us later on. I find about uh, three-fourths of them have had malaria, so the fact that there's a, a clinical anemia and the fact that that there are more murmurs than I would suspect in, in young men of this age group isn't, isn't real surprising. Uh, probably a fourth of them have had previous oral wounds. Of, of note, I think, to physicians is the fact that there's not an abdominal or thorax wound here, which I think basically means that people don't survive those kind of wounds usually here. Most of them are superficial wounds. That's basically the kind of things that I've been, been seeing. Hay que, hay que tomar con algún compañero, no se va a dar. Señor, no sé si lo pueden revisar de que tengo un cuadro.
porque con mi jefe lo tuvieron durante 15 minutos. Working frantically to help this man who was shot in both legs by a government sniper, these paramedics had neither the experience nor the medical aid to save their companion. He was turned over to the Green Cross in the hopes that they would give him the proper treatment. But later, Green Cross volunteers watched in horror as National Guardsmen executed the wounded guerrilla. <laughs> Just before we left uh, Key Purito, we got a box of medicines from uh, the people doing solidarity work in Europe. And uh, I just wanted to comment that every aspirin, every Band-Aid, every piece of gauze, every piece of soap uh, in that box of supplies was so appreciated and will be put to a maximum use. Uh, and it's as if every pill here is precious. Uh, I count how many more urinary tract infections I can treat. I count how many more courses of antibiotics uh, I can give. And uh, I just uh, wanted to assure you, those doing solidarity work, that, that uh, all of your efforts are, are greatly appreciated and magnified more than you can, you can ever understand from, from where you are. Sí, afuera, cada día. For more information on how you can help, write to COSCA, C-O-S-C-A, P.O. Box 1194, Salinas, California, 93902. How did you enter El Salvador and uh, work behind the line, so to speak, work in rebel-held territory? You must have had to have some type of clearance or negotiations with the rebels in order to do this. Well, that's correct. I went to Mexico City where I met with uh, representatives of the Revolutionary Democratic Front, the political arm of the opposition, and negotiated the terms of my service, which were that I would remain neutral in accordance with the Geneva Conventions, mm -hmm. that I would not carry arms, and that I would work <coughs> with a civilian population. I also said I hoped to communicate with the American public they couldn't guarantee that, but they said it would be a local option that uh, was dependent upon security conditions. And so you entered then El Salvador? In March of 1982, I went to the Guasapa Front, mm -hmm. an area about 20 miles north of San Salvador. And in that area, which is 15 miles by 15 miles, or eight hours on a side walking, there were about 10,000 civilians, 40% of whom were under age 12, that were to be my responsibility for the next year. Gracious. What, did, uh, wh what is life like there? What uh, type of conditions are the people facing? And also, what are the types of changes which the rebels have made in the areas where, in which they have under their control? Well, those are broad questions, but okay, uh, we'll take, what we'll are the take conditions some swift like? strokes on <laughs> them. Uh, working there is very positive in some ways because I think the society that's unfolding is a reflection of their of their hopes for the future. There are, for instance, many agricultural cooperatives functioning there now called revolutionary cooperatives. Ten years ago, those might have been called campesino cooperatives of the Federation of Christian Campesinos, or they might have been called Catholic cooperatives. So, despite the fact that malnutrition is the most serious problem in El Salvador, there are very few cases of frank malnutrition in the Guasapa Front. Food is distributed more equitably. And the fishing cooperative that catches 150 pounds of fish a day distributes that equitably so the pregnant women and the wounded patients who have higher protein needs get that fish, for instance. There is a functioning civil government, although primitive. Every town has a town council made up of representatives of the health sector, of the education sector, of the agricultural or production sector, of the local militias, of the honor and justice committees, which are the primitive but functioning legal system, and of the, of the mayors of the villages. Those popular committees, as they're called, make decisions on behalf of the villages and meet with the, with the people once every two weeks in open forums where priorities are discussed and, and uh, problems are solved. Sounds like New England town meetings of another century in American life, a sort of a form of participatory democracy. Well, they're very, they're very similar to that. And people ask me sometimes, they say, well, are officials elected? Mm -hmm. uh, because somehow we equate elections with democracy. And I couldn't say they're always elected. They're, they're selected. Mm -hmm. uh, a health care worker would be giving more medicine to his family than distributing to the village, and they would 
call him before the uh, village and discuss it. And if his attitude uh, wasn't right, they would uh, ask him to step down and they would say, who else wants to serve us? And maybe two people would raise their hands and they'd say, now why do you want to serve us? And they'd discuss it and they'd say, well, let's give this person a try. And so there was a, there was a process of perhaps uh, agreement uh, by consensus on how decisions were reached, but I very seldom saw saw votes as such. Mm -hmm. about well, votes here, election? whoever has the most money uh, can get the election, basically, about 80-85% right. of the time. What are they doing for education? Well, there are 30 elementary schools there, and uh, there's also adult education available for people that want to read and write, and a lot of the adults are learning to read and write, mm -hmm. but there are a number of tough conditions there. One, there's no electricity, and everything in a control zone has to be smuggled in, so there are very few batteries and candles were precious, so what takes place takes place during the day, and those hours are very precious for, for farming or doing whatever work is necessary. So the adults that want to learn do so uh, at great sacrifice because they have to sacrifice time from their primary jobs, whatever those are. What about the situation of uh, women? We know in Latin America women suffered double burdens of oppression in most countries. And I had heard from a woman from El Salvador that in the so-called liberated zones, the situation of women had improved greatly. Did you see any evidence of this yourself? Well, they are participating in the revolution, and women in general are bringing those issues into people's consciousness. Uh, there are going to be changes, but very slow ones. There is a machismo built into that society that is not overturned in, in the matter of a few years. Women now almost assume a double burden because uh, they are always mothers uh, and heads of households first. And many of them say, I want to work in a revolutionary agricultural cooperative. So that means they'll put in three hours in that. That doesn't lessen their housework. Mm -hmm. However, in the army, the men now are washing the corn to make tortillas. They're grinding the corn to make the tortillas. They're washing their own clothes. They're gathering the wood four jobs that have always been a job of women in El Salvador. And men are doing this with, with some reluctance and some joking, but they're assuming those tasks that women have always done before. Well, there are also women who are fighting as equal partners alongside the men, aren't they? Absolutely, and they're probably right now no more than 10 or 15 percent <coughs> uh, women who are combatants, but they're also moving into other spheres that they haven't before. So a lot of the health workers being trained are women, a lot of the communications uh, people being trained are women, and women have opportunities that they haven't previously had. Uh, certainly there is a consciousness raising going on all the time within the whole process of revolution. What sort of threats do these people in El Salvador who are trying to build a new society and take democratic control of their life face from the government? Did you see examples of government incursions into these zones where there are bombing raids? Were there government troops coming in, and how did they relate to these people in these areas? A control zone means an area in which the, the guerrillas, who are the sons and daughters of the campesinos there, have defended, and the soldiers or death squads can't enter unless they mount a huge operation. Campaign. So a daily fact of life, the last six or eight months that I was there, mm -hmm. were air attacks by American supplied aircraft. And there wasn't a day since July of 19... 82, that there weren't either A-37 fighter bombers attacking, Huey helicopters strafing, or observations planes rocketing the zone. And the area is so small that one aircraft can dip a wing and strafe here, roll back over and bomb there with absolute impunity. The guerrillas have no air, any aircraft capability. They don't. Whereas in Vietnam, they did quite a few American planes. Oh, they had the most sophisticated anti-aircraft capability in the world between their mm -hmm. missiles and their and their electronically uh, or radar controlled any aircraft guns. I think that's probably one of the biggest evidences I saw that they aren't receiving any significant support from the outside. Mm -hmm. They fight with fairly primitive weapons and certainly don't have any, any great uh, supplies of, of munitions. During an invasion mm -hmm. by the government soldiers, everyone knew they had to flee. Mm -hmm. And anyone who was caught by the government soldiers usually died and their bodies would indicate to me they died a fairly unmerciful death. I had a 76-year-old patient once who was too tired to flee. He had bad arthritis in both knees and he stayed and hid. They found him and almost twisted his arms off before they, they killed him. 
I am pleased that some Americans get upset when I talk about the use of napalm there, but I think the truth of the matter is most of the people I knew would rather they die from napalm uh, than be caught by the government soldiers. Or that barbaric. It was that, uh, it was that barbaric. Well, they slaughter babies uh, also. I found a 22-day-old baby with a, with a bullet hole in its forehead surrounded by powder burns. Uh, it, most interesting for me was uh, learning the history of the front, most of which I did through patient interviews. Mm -hmm. So in a prenatal interview, I would ask a pregnant woman, how many pregnancies have you had? And she mm -hmm. might say eight. And say, how many children do you have living? And she would say one. And I would say, how many abortions or miscarriages? And she would say one. And I said, what happened to the others? There'd be this outpouring of anguish. And then she might say, well, they were burned in the house uh, at the massacre of Saka Mill. And I'd say, well, what do you mean? And she'd say, well, that's when the government soldiers surrounded a house and burned 36 women and children. And I naively said, well, why didn't they run like we do now? And she said, well, that was before we knew we were the enemy. We had never belonged to an organization nor gone to a demonstration. Uh, so the people in this area uh, were labeled subversives because of what was happening. And what was happening, for the most part, was an awakening that I think that was in large part caused by the message of Vatican II, of Medellin and Puebla, what we call liberation theology, that mm -hmm. told these very religious people that their misery was not the result of God's will, but rather the greed of a few men, and they could change that. And so these base Christian communities inspire people to examine their own reality and begin to address it in nonviolent Christian ways. So they formed associations of campesinos, they formed cooperatives, they formed unions, all of which were a threat to the existing order mm -hmm. and invited repression first from death squads. Their sons and daughters began ambushing those death squads that led to the calling of the government soldiers to come in and a spiral of violence leading to the revolution as we know it today. How are you treated in the United States by the press, for instance? Well, there have been a number of articles about me, and, and some people say, gee, that's really terrific that we're getting such press coverage here. But the truth of the matter is it's been rather difficult. Uh, a number of the major dailies that, that I attempted to talk to basically said, there's nothing new to talk about El Salvador. We're not interested in an, in an interview. Uh, I've gotten pretty good coverage when I've gotten in the door and, and been able to talk to some and been very pleased by that. I think that uh, the media coverage of El Salvador is very interesting. The recent, that is the July-August issue of NACLA, has some very good examples of what happens. There's a picture in Nicaragua of children and mothers waiting in line with pails. The caption that appeared with that picture in Business Week was, disgruntled Nicaraguans waiting in long lines for ration food. The phot photographer who took that picture explained that that was women and children getting free meat and milk rations, which are given to the poor in, in Nicaragua today. So we have those kinds of distortions. And mm -hmm. about 80% of what Americans hear, it seems like, either comes from the administration, from the State Department, or from the embassy. Those are the sources that our media usually picks up and listens to and it's very difficult to hear the other side of the story. When you're on, say, talk shows like here in Austin, mm -hmm. how do the callers, the people who call in, what are their attitudes? Well, I was very, very surprised here in Austin that about 80% of the calls have been very supportive to the message that I carry, and that is that, that we could be seeking peaceful solutions in El Salvador, that perhaps we're stopping change and adding to the violence rather than understanding the process that's happening there. That's not always uh, always true, of course. There is a lot of red baiting sometimes on talk shows. I do nighttime talk radio shows because uh, the audience is very different. When I give a public talk, like I will here at the university, there may be 300 people interested in Central America. When I do a talk radio show, there may be 5,000 or 10,000 that don't want to hear about Central America and <laughs> perhaps need to learn a little bit more about it from a different perspective. And what sorts of other distortions have you seen in the American media of the situation in Central America as you've observed it or as you understand it? Has there been a fairly systematic distortion, do you think, or just ignoring of things? Or? I think there is a, a propaganda campaign that's going on right now, which the United States media has bought into, in a sense, mm -hmm. in that they certainly swallow <coughs> basically whatever the administration 
uh, the State Department Embassy says without challenging it, and they can get away with distortions that other people couldn't. Uh, probably the biggest part of that is painting this as a Soviet East-West confrontation when there has been very little or any evidence of arms flow coming into El Salvador. The only evidence presented so far was the white paper, which was thoroughly discredited by the Wall Street Journal. And yet the media continues to say the large flow of arms coming from Nicaragua and El Salvador via, via Cuba and to support that contention, which is the basis of much of our policy in the region. Finally today, and it's August 1st for the listeners that will be seeing this later in the year, the New York Times carried an article in which Reagan administration officials admitted, as well as Salvadoran military officials admitted, that they could see no evidence of an arms flow from uh, Nicaragua to the guerrillas this year. That was my experience there. I saw the weapons they fought with. I've spoken with groups that included ex-directors of the CIA, ex-ambassadors, ex-members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I've said, perhaps I'm naive, but I would like to see your evidence because I didn't see it. I'm puzzled that the most sophisticated intelligence service in the world that has aircraft that fly over El Salvador daily can take pictures of a package of cigarettes from 50,000 feet and read the print can't come up with any evidence. And they say, we don't want to compromise our sources. And I say, your sources are these aircraft. Your sources are the AWACS plane. We just had stationed down there whose job it was to detect these aircraft that allegedly come into El Salvador every night. They couldn't detect any in more than three months on station. And I think that's basically because there is no great arms flow. I was, because of my neutrality and, and, and uh, uh, because I'm a Quaker, was given the responsibility of negotiating the release of prisoners of war from the guerrillas to the International Red Cross and I had a chance to, to meet these young men. Young men as young as 14, all of whom were drafted or forcibly conscripted. Young men who, who all admitted that they thought officers sold munitions to, to the guerrillas or arms to the guerrillas. Young men who don't have many choices. If you say, why don't you avoid your draft notice, they'll say, it endangers our families. If you say, why don't you desert, they'll say, we've seen the pictures of deserters whose inscriptions on their pictures say, family killed in a crossfire. And there have been a number of cases of, uh, of that. Young men who admit to killing women and children and are taught to do so. But young men who also surrender as one of the few options to them. And after spending a couple of weeks with the guerrillas and Inglesava, they were guarded in homes, go back profoundly demoralized because they find the people they're fighting are like themselves. They're poor, but they see families, they see worship services, they see schools, they see clinics and distribution of food unlike they've ever seen before. So early on, I never saw more than one or two, three prisoners. When they start being turned over to the Red Cross and therefore guaranteeing their, their survivability because before that the government would kill them, they started telling their comrades what was happening. They started to surrender in 30s and 40s. By December, an entire company of over 100 surrendered. And in 1983, the guerrillas have captured over 1,000 prisoners of war and 1,500 weapons. They really can't field many more troops than, than that. The guerrillas can't. Uh, so they don't need any arms from the outside. But I think the major point the press has not uh, paid much attention to is that whether Marx, Sandino, or Castro were ever born or not, there would be a revolution in Central America. And U.S. foreign policy is only contributing to the violence and is probably the greatest obstacle to peace there by supporting this very brutal and and corrupt regime. What do you think the real reason is for the American foreign policy in that area? You know, and we would assume they know, that there's no real Soviet threat in that area. Is it just to try to stem the tide of third world revolutions to overcome the so-called post-Vietnam syndrome to show that America will not tolerate any more revolutionary movements in the third world? What, what are you thinking about the real reasons for American foreign policy in that area? Well, I don't think there's a, a simple answer, but certainly there's a lot of short-sightedness on the part mm -hmm. of, the, of the Reagan administration. Uh, I think the problem is, is that we lose if we associate ourselves with a military victory or defeat in El Salvador. Uh, if we win, we have only identified ourselves with forces of repression and postponed the next insurrection. If we lose, uh, we have only lost the opportunity to bring peace to Central America through some sort of negotiated process with the Contador group and the people who are most concerned about it, the Central Americans themselves. I think that probably 
there's a number of factors, the most important being that we're preserving the ability of the United States to operate politically and economically the way it would choose in Central America. And I'm reminded of that quote by, by Marine General Smedley Brown, who said, I made Cuba safe for uh, the Brown Brothers Banking in 1914. I made Nicaragua safe for the uh, uh, National City Bank Boys. I made uh, Haiti safe for American sugar interest in 1916. This kind of attitude toward Central and South America that it's ours to even lose. An American it's, colony. Yes, it's not ours, and certainly these people should be able to decide some things for themselves. Then how, was this, how has this changed you? Now, in Vietnam, you were of the nonviolent persuasion. You know, have you had any changes within, within you to see where maybe violence can be justified after being down in El Salvador? Well, I don't think pacifism or a commitment to nonviolence <laughs> means, except naively, that, that uh, those are not realities in this world. I think the most serious pacifists are those that, that look to remove the causes of war, of which are corruption, brutality, uh, the kind of uh, poverty that we see in Central America. My understanding of nonviolence was, was certainly changed a lot in El Salvador, and I was able to maintain my commitment to it, but I was thrown a rifle one time when, when we were evacuating about 12 patients, and it took two men each to carry the bamboo poles that the hammocks were slung from, and one of them threw me a, a rifle, and I had to ask myself, was I going to use that, and, and what would it mean to leave my body beside the road, or would I allow those patients who were wounded to fall into the hands of the government soldiers, who were often especially brutal with wounded patients, what, what would that serve? I didn't have to answer that question, but at another time in a, in a base Christian community, one of the campesinos wanted to know more about uh, uh, what it meant to be a Quaker. They couldn't understand why I didn't carry an arm, because certainly the other physicians uh, did there. And I tried to explain a little bit about nonviolence, and, and this man very, very politely stopped me, and he said, now my job on the hacienda, he pointed to it, it was just over the way, he said, had been to feed the dogs, and I had to give them a large bowl of milk every morning, and I could never afford milk for my children. He said, when the dogs were ill, I would have to take them to the veterinarian in Suchitoto. And he said, I had never been able to afford to take my children to the doctor in Suchitoto, and some of them died for lack of medical care. So, he said, you gringos think of violence in terms of what's done with a machete or a gun, but there's another kind of violence, a violence to the spirit, and until you've seen your children starve, you can't understand that kind of violence. And uh, it was a very profound lesson. I don't think the people in El Salvador have resorted to violence as anything but a last resort, and many of them even did that very reluctantly. Let me make a plug for medical aid, and I would say this to, to the listening audience, that the Salvadoran people really make a distinction between the American people and the American government. And, and you can help in that process because when they see the daily gifts from the American government, bombs, rockets, machine gun bullets, it, it's a message of destruction. And you can give them the uh, message of hope in the form of, of medical aid. Uh, I work with an organization that distributes medical aid in El Salvador. It's called the Salvadoran Medical Relief Fund, P.O. Box 1194, Salinas, California, 93902. And I would encourage uh, your listeners to support any kind of humanitarian aid, whether it's this organization or one that you are more familiar with, to send another message to the people of El Salvador until we can change this foreign policy. Well, thank, thank you, you, Charlie. Thank you. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78712. Good night.